Hello, I'm Chelsea Randall, co-director of Extensity Concert Series in New York. And I'd like to welcome you to our special panel discussion in honor of International Women's Day on equity and diversity in classical and new music. This event is part of the programming of Women Now, our festival celebrating living women identifying composers, which runs through March 26. I'd like to introduce our wonderful panelists that are here with us today, Anna Abrantes, cellist and director of education at the Sphinx Organization, Haley Olson, composer and manager of artist services at American Composers Forum, Unbi Kim, pianist and board member at the New York Foundation for the Arts and co-founder of Bespoken, and Christine Rusnak, composer and president of the International Alliance for Women in Music. So I wanna jump right into the topic of the panel. So while times have changed and nowadays women and women identifying composers have more forums for expression and uh, for opportunity, their music is still wildly underrepresented and underperformed. And I wanna jump in this conversation with some hard facts. So I'm gonna read the numbers that uh, have been published in a recent research by the Donna Foundation, which is a charitable foundation in the UK that estimates that 95% of the music programmed by major orchestras in the world is by male composers exclusively. A little over 1% is by Black and Asian women identifying or women composers. A little over 2% is by Black and Asian male identifying composers. So the conversation about gender equity and diversity in classical music um, is not new. Uh, it actually stretches back to at least 100 years um, ago uh, with you know, the creation, for instance, of the Royal Society for Female Musicians in the UK in uh, 1839. And in recent years, um, the conversation has been expanding uh, and there were more and more initiatives uh, coming out, um, as you will, of course, illustrate as well uh, during the course of this panel. However, even within some of the most prestigious initiatives uh, or the most important and forward initiatives um, that are you know, bringing on the conversation um, on diversity and equity, we can still find a systemic discrimination. In this context, and given the stats that Francesca just read off to us, what are the priority issues concerning representation in classical and new music today in your estimation particularly as you've been able to observe from your position within your organization and your respective artistic fields. So I'd like to address this question first to Anna of the Sphinx organization. Um, our priority is to uh, give voice um, to those who are underrepresented. So we listen to the community. Um, our main um, purpose as an organization is to keep the idea of a family. So artists that um, participated in one of the educational programs continue as uh, one of our performing artists and then they come back as a faculty. And um, we also um, encourage um, young ones to become composers. And, and so it's a big, big family. And that's our priority to make sure that our family has been um, exposed and is getting their voice out there. Um, and so initiatives um, that we've done uh, in our uh, tours, we have four touring ensembles. Uh, and one example is last uh, October, we were at Carnegie Hall performing with performing with Sphinx Virtuosi, it's our string orchestra, and 100% of our repertoire uh, was from underrepresented composers, some living composers and some um, um, composers that haven't been performed, uh, such as Florence Price, um, but we also had Jesse, Jesse Montgomery, Andrea Casarubios, and so many others um, that uh, perhaps are not well known out there. And that's, again, our priority to make sure that they are known now. In our organization, we've actually discovered so many incredible composers and musicians through Sphinx and platform them. So we, we thank you and all that you're doing for introducing us to so many incredible musicians. So I'd like to move to uh, Christina and address the same question. I think for the International Alliance for Women in Music, our priorities are to increase the visibility, to advocate. We are an advocacy organization and to provide visibility for the uh, 
women who are not only our members, but are out in the industry. So we try to partner with sister organizations. I'm very familiar with Gabriella at, at Donna UK with Elizabeth Brito at the Daffodil uh, Perspective. And we also try to give opportunities. IAWM was one of the first organizations that provided uh, competitive awards for uh, women composers or those who identify as women. And we've been looking at uh, opportunities to expand those awards. We've recently expanded into an education grant, a programming award, and a couple of years ago we started a jazz award. Uh, we are looking at other opportunities going forward. Uh, we want to get a greater uh, representation, greater visibility to those women uh, who've been underrepresented in the past. Um, we have started a global initiatives uh, uh, committee to really help us make this happen. Uh, let's move on to Umbi Kim. So one of the biggest priorities at NIFA is to hire a director of DEIA right now. That's an ongoing process that's, that's started. And I know that's a huge priority for our executive director, Michael Royce. Um, a year ago, I was brought into the board. That was a specific initiative to diversify the board. So there were five new, new members of the board that spanned um, representation across all fronts. And um, there have been uh, several awards um, dedicated to women. Um, there's the New York City Women's Fund for Media, Music, and Theater, the Canadian Women Artists Fund uh, Award. And then um, very recently, in collaboration with Anonymous Was a Woman, uh, NIFA will be distributing uh, $250,000 to women over 40 living anywhere in the US whose work involves climate change. So. Um, so these competitive grants, I think, are, are um, have a lot of focus, as well as a lot of our other grant programs that um, focus on inclusion. And I think one of the priorities that I've been observing um, so far, especially being on the programming committee, is a priority on accessibility, um, especially in terms of like the applications. So this past summer, um, the uh, the big award was the NIFA City Artists Core Grants. And that application, um, if you're not familiar, was was a very simple application sort of based like kind of like a lottery system, as long as you met certain eligibility requirements. And um, there was a lot of effort put in to um, give people assistance with the application, technical assistance. It was provided in three languages, English, Spanish, Chinese. Um, NIFA partnered with 15 um, organizations to provide um, translations for nine languages total for the application. So to make the application process accessible as possible is something that I've observed um, with this particular award as well as the other programs and, and initiatives. At American Composers Forum, we envision a world where living music creators are celebrated and they're essential to human culture. Um, we're leading catalysts in the ecosystem. We invite composers, advocates, and supporters to pursue the vision with us. And our mission is to support and advocate for individuals and groups creating music. We want to demonstrate the vitality and relevance of their art. And we have been doing that in the last couple of years within a new strategic framework. Um, since 2018, when I joined the organization, there have been major changes that have touched every part of our work, from our programs and granting, to the language that we use, to our mission and vision statement, and the way that we look at our interactions and the services we provide to artists. In 2020, um, we, as a result of a very extensive review and equity training process, um, adapted new um, uh, values for the organization, one of which was anti-racism. And so through the framework of anti-racism, we seek to include um, several different um, identities, including gender identities, musical approaches and perspectives, religions, ages, disabilities, and broad definitions of being American as well. Uh, so within this racial equity framework, 
we have a public commitment um, that we are holding ourselves accountable to through summits, uh, through different report cards, and through advocacy, support, and leading by example. We do this by partnering with organizations on initiatives, by reevaluating and changing the language in our programs to include artists that have previously been excluded, and also to create new gathering spaces for artists to discuss topics such as equity, inclusion, and exclusion. So I would say that our main goal is to continue changing our systems and processes within the organization to be able to be a go-to space for artists. Thank you. And I would like to move to another question. And Haley, maybe you can start answering this first. Um, when we talk about diversity and equity, gender equity in music, classical music, in your experience, and you know, from, from the place you have within your organization, do you think we are clear on what the goal should be in our field? And in particular, when, you know, when answering this question, I would like to bring attention on what do you think is important um, and or how important it is the difference between initiatives and programming that prioritize inclusion uh, versus spotlighting. And, and yeah, and maybe give us an example of that. Sure, absolutely. I, I have thought about these words too in my work as an artist and approaching it from a composer's perspective, when I am looking at initiatives to join um, different calls to apply for or artists to work with, I haven't specifically considered the words inclusion versus spotlighting, but what I pay a lot of attention to is the language that's used in those programs and whether the words that are on the page are reflective of the values within the organization. Um, in my work at Composers Forum, I see so many calls come in and I also have the opportunity to work one-on-one -on -one with ensembles and organizations who are looking for feedback, who are looking to attract a more diverse pool of composers and creators, and um, who are looking to reevaluate their processes as well. And so I think a, a really big part of my work is talking about how the language is reflected throughout the entire call from start to finish. Um, often, and especially I think in the last two years, we have seen many organizations talk about diversity initiatives, and that's reflected in the language in their calls, um, saying things like, we would like BIPOC composers to apply, we encourage women and composers of underrepresented genders to apply, but essentially the program is still the same. There are still some of the same barriers like fees, the expectation that you need to travel and cover your own travel and housing, the expectation that uh, you will not get a recording and that you won't necessarily receive um, any money from performances of the work. So what I like to do is work with um, organizations from the ground up to really talk about how are we centering the artists. When we look at the intrinsic value of an artist, that really changes the way that we reimagine and shape these programs because it is encouraging a genuine, authentic partnership and a sustained partnership that does not just last through one single call. Um, and that lets the artists really speak for themselves, write about what they want, and then continue to work with this organization. So we have been looking at different ways to do this and support artists throughout our programs and that you know viewing um, all of our work as really supporting the artist and what they want to do and allowing them to share their authentic voice um, I see that as more of an inclusion measure rather than just saying these are diverse artists that we are going to spotlight for one concert I think that if you know things like Black History Month and Women's Month, um, they are opportunities to spotlight work of talented artists. But I think if that is the one time of the year that you are spotlighting those works, you need to reevaluate your processes and and think about how is this something that we can do the whole year through, and how can we do it in a really genuine way. So 
for me, it comes down to the relationship building and seeing how that spreads throughout the organization and touches every single part of your programming process. Thank you, Haley. And I would like to ask the same uh, question um, to Umbi, um, not only from the perspective of working within NIFA, but also with this program. Sure, sure. So I think the question about whether we're all thinking about inclusion and diversity in this in the same way, I think my opinion is is no. Um, I, I think we all maybe have different ideas of what that means. And at NIFA, um, we we have lots of um, awards and grants that go towards the different populations. We have um, awards that go with, for um, our or go towards artists with disabilities. Um, we have programs specifically for immigrant artists. Um, we have um, also the incubator of executive leaders of color that that was just launched. Um, so I think I think diversity can mean a lot to different different organizations. But at NIFA, I'm seeing like a wide spectrum of what diversity looks like. Um, beyond just um, gender and race. Um, in terms of inclusion and, and spotlighting, um, I really haven't been at NIFA long enough to <laughs> see the, the benefits of, of each, each one. Um, I, I know for, for We Spoken, um, our program as a whole is geared towards women and non-binary artists. And as Haley mentioned, it's like an ongoing relationship building um, endeavor where we hope that all the fellows um, come in and leave with um, understanding that there's a community that's, that's going to be there to support them. Um, and we strive to give them the practical tools to, to leave with so that they can feel empowered um, to share what they've learned and share um, what they've, they've gained with each other. And I would like to move to Anna, if you can give us your take um, on what is, in your opinion, the difference in initiatives between, um, you know, spotlighting and including, and what are the benefits of both or what are the, you know, challenges? Right, and this is maybe the, the one thing that I admire the most about Sphinx, that Sphinx can balance um, both sides really well. Um, it started with a focus more on spotlighting. It, it, it was born with a competition. Um, so giving exposure and promoting um, string musicians of color. Um, but from the very beginning, the Sphinx organization had a clear goal um, when analyzing the numbers, the two biggest mi um, minority groups, Black and Latinx, uh, were the least represented in American orchestras. And so by uh, our working thought that by spotlighting those musicians in those two m m minority groups, that the numbers would change in their American orchestras. So that was a very clear goal from the start. Um, now, as we grow, things um, start to grow as well and the mission starts to expand but that was the initial goal so each organization and each community will have a different goal depending on the community they're serving so the first thing is to have a very clear goal what you want to achieve and that was done from the beginning but the first program was a spotlighting program of the competition but soon enough um, the organization um, understood that you have to feed uh, that area of spotlighting somehow. And the only way to do it is by being inclusive and by um, offering educational uh, support to musicians so they can get to that level of spot spotlighting. And so a few years in, uh, the Sphinx organization, organization grew into the educational portfolio, um, giving uh, opportunities for musicians to learn how to audition for orchestras or um, even for the beginners, you know, to have exposure to music and education and access. So uh, a local program in Michigan was started uh, giving uh, violin lessons to elementary school kids. And from there, you also expanded to summer academies to more advanced string players who then became um, participants in the competition. So uh, Sphinx was born with our um, flagship program, the competition, but now it's a pipeline uh, starting from access with the overture program offering violin uh, 
classes and lessons to elementary school kids, going through the summer academies for more uh, advanced students uh, who are preparing to get to college or the competition itself. It moves on to the competition. And from there, um, the laureates and the winners become a Sphinx artists and part of our um, ensembles and touring ensembles. Um, but then also more, more, more recently, um, the organization realized that the problem of representation was not only in American orchestras or ensembles, but also in administration. So for the past few years, we have uh, had the Sphinx Connect, uh, the biggest um, conference uh, for diversity, equity and inclusion um, in the country. Um, and that's incredible because we can combine forces with so many different organizations because we cannot do everything by ourselves. So we have to combine forces. And that's a really wonderful opportunity at the beginning of every year to get together with other organizations and make sure that we're always moving forward um, and always giving more expo exposure to um, minorities and um, uh, you know women composers and the list goes on. Um, so the the last portfolio that was added to Sphinx is um, arts and leadership and includes, as I said, the conference, but also programs preparing. So also, in, you know, the inclusion side of that is not the, the conference would be more spotlighting, but then our lead program is preparing arts and administrators to also be in the feud because that's also low in numbers when you look at the, the minority groups that we represent. Um, and so Sphinx, again, combine really well inclusion and spotlighting in a way that one side will feed the other and, and vice versa. Thank you, Anna. And Christina, what is your take on this? I agree with Umbi that I think people interpret diversity, equity, inclusion very differently. One of our focuses has been to really ensure that our whole organization is understanding it the same way um, and in a 21st century way, not a 20th century way. Um, there were many of our more long-term members who said, we are diverse, we are women. Okay, so that's, that's not really diverse. So it was really bringing our whole organization up to the same language and we're working it. It's an ongoing conversation. When we come to spotlighting, spotlight is like a photograph and I agree with all the previous uh, comments that it's, it's, and we have done this, it's a one and done, right? So we have our concert, we highlight a, a composer uh, and maybe the performers and then it, it's moving on. But when we look at, at our membership, we have churn, we have people come, we, you know, we have our one and done and then they leave, they don't engage. So how can we help and be that support and be that resource so that they can engage to everybody else's point? It was well said, we keep saying it, it's about relationships and it's about being that connective tissue between people, between organizations. Whereas inclusion and uh, Haley, I think everybody spoke on it. I view it as part of the leadership, part of the decision-making process, part of that partnership. And it does start at the top. And this is something, this is an area where we have not yet been as successful as we'd like to be. Our board is a volunteer board. It's, we don't have staff per se. And 20%, only 20% of our um, board are women of color and that has to change and so we are looking at strategies to increase not only our diversity because there's too much emphasis on what the numbers are and it's not about the numbers it's about inclusion and representation and listening and when we have more diversity when we have more inclusion and equity we have a better organization we have a better industry so um, that's a short answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and connecting to this question, I would like to go back to, um, to Haley. What do you think are the important qualities that, uh, from what you've observed, should be inherent to any diversity and equity initiative? Sure. Well, I, I just want to say that I really agree with Christina's comments about um, everybody being up to speed on the same definition. I think prior to our organization-wide conversations around equity, each of the staff members had their own ideas of diversity and how they would be able to make 
changes within their own areas. And we would have conversations as what was called, um, you know, the programs team and as a staff, but we were definitely not on the same page. And so doing that board wide and staff wide equity training, really coming up with a glossary that defined the terms within the organization, even the term composer is um, a, a definition that we have all agreed upon so that we are able to use that same language, have that shared vision, and really be on the same page about how it comes through in all of the programs. Also to what Christina said, it really needs to come from leadership. I think that staff members and diversity task forces can do work, but unless it is coming from a leadership position, unless the executive director and the board are not on board, um, there is no way that that structural change can be sustained and that it can happen. Um, you know, I think I've also seen um, in speaking with a lot of different organizations, a real fear of failure. Um, uh, first, a fear of those uncomfortable moments because you do have to confront an uncomfortable history of who you have been excluding. We had those conversations as an org and I think, you know, it was not easy to admit that previously there were groups that had been um, excluded, although we considered ourselves to be a diverse and welcoming group, we really had to look at all of the systems we had put in place and that we were continuing to, to work with that were, um, you know, excluding different composers or, you know, when people looked at the organization would say, this is not the org for me. Um, so really confronting those is necessary. Um, I think there's also uh, in programming organizations, if you're losing audience members too, or facing backlash. And again, I would say that having um, this really shared document and understanding across all staff is so important because it gives us the language and the tools to be able to respond and say, this is our vision. This is why we are doing things this way. This is why we're making those changes. And, you know, to, in to really invite that conversation. And I think, um, you know, just a constant need to hold ourselves accountable, to reevaluate, to view every single program and decision we make through this equity framework, and to say, who isn't here? What are our blind spots? Who are we not including? That has been just such an important part of reimagining our language and um, how we are choosing our curatorial panels. And it has made such a huge difference. We've seen it in um, you know, the language that has changed and the, the people who apply to the organization and just the, the reach of our initiatives. It continues to grow. And so we just continue to hold ourselves accountable in that way as well. But the accountability, I think that is a very important part of any inclusion initiative. Thank you, Haley. And Umbi, do you want to add anything to this? What do you think are the qualities that should be inherent to any initiatives uh, for diversity and um, inclusion? Uh, I, I agree with everything Haley said, um, especially um, the uncomfortable conversations and sort of the acknowledgement and sort of having the openness to, to learn. Um, I know with Bespoken, I remember one time we had um, somebody write in. So we used to have an age limit of 35 to be a fellow. And somebody wrote us saying, you know, with lots of compassion and understanding, but also saying that why we shouldn't have an age limit. And we totally agreed. Uh, and after that, we we changed it. Um, and realized it was it was a mistake to have had that age limit in the first place. But um, again, we're, we're approaching everything with sort of this openness. And there was another time where we had sort of a wide application pool, but there were no women of color who, who applied. And that was 
um, a huge sort of <laughs> reckoning that we had to do, like why this happened, how we can prevent it. And the answer for us right now with our resources is outreach. So with every single application process, it's a ton of outreach, it's a lot of effort on our parts. It's just, you know, we don't have a staff, it's just, it's just me and my co-founder that's doing all the work. Um, but that work is necessary and we're sort of learning as we, we build our organization, um, these these tools and, and resources that we need to utilize. Thank you. And Anna, um, do you have anything to add? I also agree with what Haley said. And um, Haley, you pointed everything that I was about to comment and Yumbi as well. Um, the only thing I would add is that um, in the recent years, because of tragic occurrences, we have more exposure. So it's somehow easier um, to get the word out there. And we have to take advantage of this opportunity now um, to um, identify and um, eliminate some fallacies that continue to happen. Um, when Sphinx started, there was no terminology for diversity, equity, and inclusion. These words were not a reality 25 years ago, and it is now. And um, we all um, should take the opportunity now to explain and not only preach to the choir, um, you know, openness, as Yumbi was saying, not only for us to adjust with our initiatives, but also to reach a larger community for a more sustainable and long-term change. Um, and so things like um, diversity, equity, and inclusion will sacrifice, sacrifice merit. That's a big fallacy that we have to break because uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion is the authentic recipe for merit when you give actual opportunities for people to show their merit um, or that by adding um, underrepresented composers we have to eliminate Beethoven and Brahms and that's another you know big mistake that we see out there um, inclusion the word says we include we do not exclude other composers and by explaining that and and how um, we're not serving those who are less fortunate, but we are fortunate for prioritizing representation, for giving voice to those who haven't had um, enough voice so far. It's a privilege and not like a requirement for funding or just to look beautiful on the picture. You know, it's these explanations need to get out there and we have a, the biggest opportunity so far to do so. Thank you, Anna. And I don't know, Christina, if you want to add anything else. I, I think everybody else has pretty much covered it. The only thing that I haven't heard is, I think as organizations, we have to look at systemic issues or systemic practices that we may have. Um, for instance, we are a global organization, and yet we are very biased in an anglicized part of the world. So how can we increase our global diversity and inclusion? And so we're looking at language. We're looking at the pricing of our, um, our memberships, which we consider you know, very competitive, in fact, lower than many others. But if you live in Moldova or if you live in somewhere else in Vietnam, it's, it's, it's un, they can't compare. They can't compete. They can't apply for awards. They can't apply for opportunities because the cost of membership is just too high. So we are looking at accessibility issues and, and facing some hard truths about the biases as an organization. And I think that is desperately needed for everyone to do. Uh, with the seismic social and racial reckoning of the past few years, I'm sure there has been a lot of change happening within all of your organizations. Um, and could you maybe, you know, tell us what are the initiatives you're promoting right now and how you, have you adjusted, um, you know, to reconsider, formulate and execute these new initiatives? Uh, maybe, you know, maybe, uh, Christina, you want to go first? Oh, wow. Um, I think what we've, we've done is really increased our focus and had that hard look on any systemic issues that we had within our organization, any barriers that we have. We still have a membership-based organiz uh, membership organization, 
But what we've really done is we've said, where should we have our concerts? Where should we have our conferences? Where should we, how should we um, make our opportunities more inclusive so that we attract the people that we want to, to focus and provide visibility to? So one of the things that we are doing is trying to make sure we get out of our, of our bubble, get out into the communities uh, there's the Women um, Women in Music Conference in Mississippi this coming weekend. Uh, so we have two people representing the board there. What other places can we go to reach people and to gain increased um, diversity and inclusion? As far as specific racial issues, we're trying to look at it holistically and not just through the lens of George Floyd. We're, we're trying to say, how can we be more sensitive? Uh, for instance, we had our last concert in November at Howard University. We made sure that the community at Howard University was included in the selection of the concert pieces, in the performance of the concert pieces, uh, et cetera. So those are some of the things that we are doing in light of the racial inequities. I will say, it's not enough. What we're doing is not enough yet, but we have it on our horizon to do more. Uh, we have a, an award for uh, black and underrepresented women, but how can we do more than just have that one award? So we're not there yet, but we are working on it. Thank you, Christina. And I think in this, um, in this perspect, uh, perspective, uh, smaller organizations, smaller presenters are also doing their part. Um, and some of the bigger ones are catching up as well. Um, and with that, I want to, you know, pass this question um, to Anna. Um, as I mentioned, the, the tragic events of the past few years um, spotlighted organizations like the Sphinx organization. We didn't start any new initiatives because 100% of our work is already in that direction. Um, but at the same time, it gives us more exposure to then um, partner with other institutions to then change their view on, on, on this issue. Um, and again, the work has been happening for a long, long, long time, 25 years for Sphinx, but only in the past couple of years, we feel that we have um, this a bigger opportunity to get the word out there. Um, and um, we, could help artists that were part of our database this past few years. So when thinking about the pandemic and, and, and how musicians were affected, we could, through the new partnerships and the exposure that we got because of tragic events, support our artists in a way that, you know, could help them through the pandemic. On new initiatives, we did have a couple of artist funds, um, fund reliefs and, and applications that they could apply for this past couple of years. Um, but again, and Sphinx itself did not create any new program the past couple of years, but we were able to partner with more organizations who did. Thank you. And Haley, what's your take on this? Sure. I think um, this has had a huge impact on the organization, especially as we are based in St. Paul. Um, we were in the middle of planning our statement of commitment to racial equity, and we had already hosted one of our, our very first equity summit um, when, you know, George Floyd was murdered and, you know, it, it sent ripples throughout the St. Paul community. Um, and I think it really did expose a lot of the systemic issues and barriers built into these larger and smaller institutions, you know, we saw a lot of calls for, for change, for more diversity in programming, and also in genuine engagement with artists. So I would say that it has um, kind of reiterated the importance of organizations, particularly historically white and white-led organizations to do this work, um, which is something that we have taken very seriously. We've continued to hold equity summits and monthly equity study groups so we can address, you know, and continue conversations and engage with our community members, um, because that is something that we really want to do to make sure that it is not just internal work that 
these are continued conversations we're having with artists in our ecosystem and inviting in. Um, so it has certainly influenced the way we look at language and the way that we adapt our policies and also how we um, think about our equity summits in the future too. In our 2021 equity summit, we talked about follow up and follow through and sustained community engagement, um, how we can create land acknowledgements and then work beyond them so they are not simply a statement and also how organizations can hold ourselves accountable. We really think about how we, as this organization, have a responsibility to highlight and amplify the voices of composers, music creators, artists who have been underrepresented. Um, an example of an initiative that we had um, in the uh, summer of 2020 was called Uneven Measures. And that was a series that highlighted um, gender equity uh, through the lens of racial equity. And we really invited many composers, uh, women, trans and non-binary artists to speak about first, what the 19th Amendment meant to them because it was the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. And to talk about how it included some composers and some, some women <laughs> um, in more equitable practices, but it also excluded many others. And so through essays and interviews and panel discussions, we were able to amplify those voices and talk about equity in a really intersectional and intentional way. So we continue to um, work with those practices, with our strategic plan, and we continue to hold ourselves accountable. We are publishing a report card every year to track our progress. And that has been very helpful to see how internally and externally we're changing and how far we still have to go. Thank you, Haley. And Ombi, do you want to do you want to answer add anything to this? Sure. Um, I think through my involvement with NIFA over the years before joining the board, I've noticed that they, the organization has, I think, been doing the work in, in diversity and inclusion. And I think in, in these past recent years, they've just only amplified the, the work that they had been doing. Um, as mentioned before, one of the um, reasons I was brought into the board was because they wanted to add more representation to the board. So they had at, they're continuing to do that. Um, and I think it does make a, a, a great difference um, in the um, in the programming and the various initiatives that are taking place. I think the conversations are, are very interesting and provide a lot of different perspectives. Um, there have been new programs um, very recently, the, the Incubator of Executive Leaders of Color that was launched this fiscal year and will happen again next year. And then um, there's a partnership with the US Latinx Art Forum where NIFA will be distributing $50,000 in unrestricted cash awards to 15 Latinx artists. And um, this past uh, summer with the with the city artist core grants um, that was distributed uh, that was a distribution of five thousand dollars to three thousand artists in five boroughs and the intention behind that was to target neighborhoods hardest hit by the pandemic the disabled and low-income artists so those are some of the responses that NIFA has taken um, over you know some of these past year's events and um, I, I think I think it was it was very important for them to add new voices to the board. I think that that does make a big difference. The recent application that they sent out was in English, Spanish, and Chinese um, automatically, and then um, nine additional languages were were added um, through various partnerships and, and making that application available. Um, I'm I'm on the programming committee and. Uh, I remember we had an entire meeting about the language that we're using for the various uh, demographic markers. You know, I think traditionally there's like usually eight kind of choices. And, and I think we were looking at like over 20. And it was very interesting because I think we all sort of have very different ideas of, of how to include and, 
and maybe it's not possible to include everybody and maybe we need a self-identify button and then but then how do we gather the information that we need um, to report to uh, funders um, about some of the outcomes we have so I think it's it's an ongoing um, ongoing process of making the applications as accessible as possible thank you and um, Haley what's your take on this yeah, absolutely. So I would say that our grant making policy, um, in our grant making policy, the language has been such a huge factor in inclusion. We really have asked ourselves, um, who are we reaching and welcoming? Who are we including? And how do we find a shared language over the full curatorial process? You know, um, we have been using um, Eleanor Savage's retool document, which outlines how to implement racial equity into every step of the panel process. So, um, you know, really working with her closely to craft that language, um, you know, passing that by the equity committee and taking their feedback and then the artist support committee to see how it could be reaching more artists. Um, and then we really looked at the impact for each program that we had existing. And um, we advise applicants in the pre-application phase. And you know, we've also, like I had mentioned, changed the ways in which the data is collected so that you know, artists are able to self-identify. That is uh, really important. And we really take the feedback to heart. We don't see it necessarily necessarily as a challenge so much as an opportunity to learn. So anytime that we receive um, feedback about language and, and how we could be changing the process um, to, to be easier, um, we certainly take that to heart. And, and one of the people who has been really helpful in this process too has been um, the artist Mary Piumjian, who spoke about a lot of barriers to entry for these programs at the Artist Equity Summit. So we have implemented some things like um, allowing artists to make a video instead of a, a written artist statement. Um, we have allowed artists to send in visual scores or to send in recordings if they're able to give an explanation of their process. Um, if an artist is an improviser and they create primarily improvised music, um, you know, they can send in that music and describe how they were a part of that creation process. And so really allowing for a, a larger range of creative expressions. And then we also follow up with each artist afterwards if they are interested in receiving feedback. Um, we speak with them about feedback that they receive from the, the panel, even if they were not selected, um, which goes a long way in continuing the relationship, offering resources if they ask for more support, and then encouraging people to apply again. We've seen a greater increase in people applying, you know, in in the next years if they were not selected. Um, a, another recent change to the panel, to a, a panel process is with our in-house recording label, Innova. They recently put out a, a national call and are currently going through the submissions. Um, and previously, um, Innova asked people to submit their own works that were primarily very close to being finished. Um, you know, in the interest of making it more inclusive, uh, my, my colleagues Chris Campbell and Tim Eigel um, selected a, a broader curatorial panel of artists with diverse perspectives and created language from that anti-racist framework that really um, invited artists to send in projects at all stages of creation and say, and it says, you know, we will work with you and we'll meet you where you're at. And so that has been a really major change. I'm very excited to, to see the outcome of that, but just looking at every step of our process and continuing to uh, really take that feedback to heart when we're um, when we're reevaluating our programs for the next year, it is so critical to to the success of these programs. Thank you. And Christian, do you want to reflect uh, on you know how important or relevant it's been creation of creation of dedicated grants and specific language and different um, approaches uh, for grants um, in within your organization or organizations you're working with? Are you talking to me? Yes. Okay, sorry. 
Um, we are not really a granting organization. We have an education grant, but we have awards, but we don't really have grants. But what we're doing in our awards is looking at, uh, from, a, from a, an evaluation perspective, uh, we have found that our adjudicators um, are not as diverse as the population who are applying for these awards. So what we have now is we have a four panel uh, uh, group of our board members who are very diverse and have different backgrounds who are helping to select the adjudicators. Our adjudicators are not on the board. They are outside of the board in the industry, experts in the industry. So for instance, in the wind band uh, area, it's um, who, are, who are the experts in the wind band area, in the jazz awards, who are the experts in the jazz awards, uh, to ensure that we have as diverse and inclusive a group as far as the adjudicators as is reflected in our applications. And that has not happened. That's new with 2022. So, um, but I think it's, I think it's important to Haley's point is to make sure that the language is inclusive. We do have a global initiative uh, committee and part of what they are tasked with is looking at the language and making sure the language is inclusive and accessible. We are just now starting to expand our number of languages. We have it, our education grant is in Spanish. We are evaluating whether to put all of our opportunities in Spanish as well, and then what languages should come next. I just want to add really quickly, I think that the, the language is so important, and that's something that, that we should consider um, to, to break it down a little more. Um, we have been having a lot of conversations about the words American and composer and how they both carry a lot of weight and baggage and there are historical associations um, and a history of exclusion. And so one of the changes that has been really major in our granting um, processes has been also using interchangeably terms like music creator, artist, sound artist to recognize a broader range of perspectives. Just wanted to add that, but I, I love that um, idea of, you know, different languages for accessibility, Christina. Yes, and we actually have seen a lot of this change happen here with the initiative, for instance, of Creatives Rebuild, um, where one of the grant application um, actually speaks about self-identifying artists. Um, so, yeah, so I think it's reflected in many initiatives. Um, and Anna, maybe you want to give your take on this. Yes, a lot has been said, and I agree with all of you. Um, and um, I'm fortunate enough to work in an organization that um, for two things. One, we apply for grants, but we also grant, we have grants that you can apply for. So we work on that, those two areas. And also, I'm on the programming uh, staff, but, and we do have um, specific staff for grant proposals, and I'm lucky that I don't have to do that myself because they know the language um, and they know the, the way to apply for um, the grants that we need to make the programming work here. Um, so having an opportunity to be supported by wonderful organizations and also support artists um, who are part of our family is uh, truly special. Um, and if we want to create uh, a lasting change, we have to look beyond um, external requirements of perhaps funding or um, political issues, and we have to be able to reach a larger community. Um, so um, the, the biggest uh, challenge that we face is reaching this bigger community without being looking like we are performing or, you know, we're so woke that we um, think about representation and we don't want to see orchestras just adding a three minute piece uh, to their program and calling it representation. We want to get deeper. We want to hold ourselves accountable and understand the importance of not only representation, but inclusion and equity and opportunity and justice. Um, so the, the biggest challenge is the language and how to get the, the language understood by a larger group of people. Thank you for sharing all your thoughts on this. Just to wrap up the panel with this very last question, what do you all think are the next steps? What are the priorities for your organization in addressing these issues of gender and racial equity as we moved into, into a future that's 
irreparably changed now. And all of you are musicians and composers in your own rights. And I would love to hear what your priorities are now as artists. Uh, Christina, we can, we can start with you again, if you'd like. I think one of the priorities and, and some of these organizations represented are doing this better than we are is to ensure that we have representation at the top in our board. Uh, and uh, I was it you Umbi, who said you were selected, you were asked to join the board. Uh, we have not done that. We have largely self selected or nominated and then we all vote. But because we have are largely a European based, you know, white organization, because we have a majority white organization, we've had some situations where we have not been as inclusive as we want to be. So do we change our process? Do we start looking at people and asking if they want to join us? Uh, that's probably one of the biggest things I see doing is, is really trying to look out across the landscape and say, who are we not including that should be included and make sure that we reach out, that we invite them. Somebody mentioned the word welcoming language, that we invite them, that we be more inclusive and take off our blinders. One of our board members said that, you know, why would black women want to be a part of your organization when you look so white? Okay. And that's a valid, that is a valid point. Uh, how do we, uh, how do we become more meaningful? How do we become more relevant? Uh, and we, we do, we want to do things very thoughtfully and carefully and with the best of intent, because as you said, we don't want to say, oh, here, here, we have a three minute, therefore we represent, that's tokenism, right? So we, we don't want to go there at all. We want to be representative in a rich and authentic way to celebrate all the music that is out there. And some may be very unfamiliar to me, and that's a wonderful thing. So that's what we're looking to do is to celebrate all the people out there that have been underrepresented in the past, in the present, and to help bring a more representational future. Incredibly important work. Uh, Unbi, would you like to share some of your thoughts? And also as a pianist, as a performing artist, uh, how have your priorities changed or, or adapted and what, what do you see for the future? Sure, I'll just also add very quickly about the invitation to the board. So uh, the the way they, that NIFA selects board members is through nomination. And so somebody had nominated me and the other members that were going to be added. And then there's, there's a whole voting process as well. But before, but be between the nomination and the vote is when um, the, the prospective board members are are asked or invited, you know, or to gauge the interest. So um, there's there's that whole process involved there. You do the same thing. Yes. Um, I think my priorities as a pianist have changed um, in recent years, in that um, I, I'm very careful with uh, the organizations and presenters that I want to work with. Um, so if I'm invited to a panel, I ask, you know, what's the makeup of the panel? If I'm invited to be on a series, like, um, you know, who are the other artists involved? And, uh, if I'm, you know, invited to teach somewhere, you know, what does the faculty makeup look like? So that's, that's very, really important to me. And a lot of times the response is really great. It's, well, actually we haven't thought about that. Actually we haven't invited. Um, you know, there's, there's not enough diversity on the program or so forth. So um, I think that's something that's definitely a priority for me as, as a performing artist, as a pianist. Um, what was the other part of that question? It, 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 <laughs> At least for your, for your organization as well. In oh, for the space, organization. Right? And what are the future steps that are being, being taken right now? Sure. Um, I asked our executive director this, uh, Michael Verse, because I, I wanted to, you know, have his take. And I think this is what he writes. He, he writes, we have instituted a search for a director of DEIA for NIFA. That is the experience and success necessary to enable NIFA to grow and delve deeper into gender racial equity goals. 
So that is, I think, a top priority for him as he continues also to build. I mean, he has been working tirelessly as well as the entire NIFA team um, to forge new partnerships. I think that's that's something, you know, the, um, uh, to such as Anonymous Was a Woman and the Latinx Arts Forum. I, I think that's really important to continue doing. And Anna, would you like to uh, give us some insights about this as well? Sure, I cannot speak for my colleagues uh, at the Sphinx organization. As I mentioned earlier, we have four large areas. Uh, one is my portfolio education and access. Uh, we also have um, performing artists and arts leadership and um, artist development. So I can't speak on the projects for those areas, but for education and access, um, our, my priority now as new director of education is making sure that we are reaching a larger community. Um, so for our local program in Detroit, we have already doubled the number of elementary schools that we're serving. Um, so we return to in person with more schools than ever before. Um, but in order to do that, we need also more funding. So um, I'm working together with our development team to make sure that we have enough support to make sure that our programs can expand um, um, in a healthy way and it will be a long lasting change for the program. So that's on my radar for that program. Um, for the Sphinx Performance Academies, we can't increase the number of students served that much um, because we have you know, limitations and how many can apply in person. But I wanna make sure that um, pieces that are being performed and um, the repertoire that the students are working on are uh, diverse. And that doesn't mean that they can't play their, uh, their Mozart violin concertos. In fact, I was just uh, watching the Detroit Symphony this past weekend and Randall Goosby was the soloist and he played a wonderful fifth Mozart violin concerto. But then as a non-core, he played um, color, color Taylor Perkinson and uh, a wonderful um, encore piece that was a big, got a bigger applause than the Mozart concerto. And now people know about that piece that they did not, um, perhaps they had listened to the Mozart violin concerto, but not the encore. So it was a wonderful opportunity to get that piece out there. And that's what I wanna do with our summer academies to make sure that students have access, first of all, to the um, music and uh, recordings and all of that. Um, one of our um, faculty groups and the Performance Academy is the Catalyst Quartet. They just released uh, a second or third volume of their um, um, project with works from Florence Price. I'm sure that the students are also exposed to that. Um, and um, I'm sure that the other portfolios as Sphinx will also want to expand. But again, I'm not going to talk um, on behalf of my colleagues. Um, I just want to see change in the future. and. Um, we need to understand that it's a slow, but it, if we move steady um, forward, um, it will be long lasting. Yes, absolutely. And as a cellist, you're a cellist, correct? What, what are your, some of your priorities moving forward in this discussion? So I haven't performed for the past two years because of the pandemic. And I, uh, before that, I had already shifted my career into arts administration. I am a cellist. I keep teaching because I love teaching cello. I don't see myself as a performer anymore, at least on a large scale. I love playing with colleagues and chamber music and I'll, I'll, I love learning new pieces and um, I'll, I'll do that um, as a hobby now. Um, and I just want to share one more thing that as a cellist, looking back over the years, um, organizations have no idea on the impact, the, the size of the impact that you have. Um, Sphinx had no idea who I was 10 years ago when I was in college. They never heard of me, but they impacted me so deeply because as a, a Latina immigrant in, in college, I was preparing the repertoire that was required for the Sphinx competition in my college years. That gave me so much energy and things to look for. I decided never to apply and, and compete in the competition, but I had colleagues who did, and that was wonderful. And years later, um, I was working already in the, another nonprofit and um, 
trying to understand the difference between being a performer and an arts administrator and some teachers telling me that I was doing the wrong thing by being behind a computer and that was not enough I had to be performing and only playing my instrument anyway so that whole um confusion completely clarified by Sphinx when I first attended the uh, Sphinx Connect uh, conference. I found myself as an arts administrator, I found my passion, I found my mission, and I could talk to other arts administrators who were in the same boat. And I could meet so many other musicians who were successful being soloists and musicians and also worked as arts administrators. So I uh, just want to, you know, as my final words here, just leave it out there that your organizations, you, you will never have the, the correct notion of the size of the impact that you have. We're so right about that. And it's, it's wonderful to hear. So Kaylee, just to close us out here, give us your perspective on this, both from the standpoint of your organization and yourself as, as a working composer. Sure, well at ACF, our goal is to um, continue centering the BIPOC narrative and to achieve a majority or 60% BIPOC representation by our 50th anniversary in 2025. Again, that's built into our strategic plan. So from my perspective as a manager of artist services, um, my goals are to not only continue to reach the, the former members that we have engaged with, but to continue to develop new programs and resources based on questions from our ecosystem and also to reach new artists. Um, you know, in the past, I have received questions from different artists to say, Am I a composer? Am I eligible for these programs? I'm not sure if I see myself in the organization. So I really try to have those conversations with artists to talk about their goals and to talk about uh, how we can welcome them into the community and, and really build that sustained relationship. Um, we also talk about that in terms of our programs and how we can continue a broader outreach um, no organization can be all things to all people, but we really think intentionally about how we are serving our community and what we can do best. Uh, another broader goal is we are having great conversations between the board, staff, and community partners, especially as it applies to racial equity, gender equity, and changes in our programs. Um, a, a broader goal is to um, explore how we can build on those conversations and make them into action steps and uh, measurable outcomes throughout the organization. Um, we are continuing to work on our programs, um, big changes at Innova. Uh, another major change that we have made is that we acquired the multimedia platform I Care If You Listen in 2020. And that has broadened the range of perspectives that we're able to share. Um, we hired a, a diverse uh, contributor team and they continue to uh, nominate so many different artists and, and bring them to us that you know we hadn't heard of that we're really excited to learn from and, and talk to. And so continuing to, to work with those communities too. Um, and because the strategic plan is a, a living document, just being able to adapt and constantly changing and being responsive to the world around us um, and also continuing to engage the good in, in all of the community members we reach. Um, as, a, as a composer and an educator, I agree with everything that has been previously said. Um, I, I wanna continue to engage the good in my own work as I'm speaking with different partners and different potential organizations I'll be working with, musicians I'll be collaborating with to really um, talk about where I, I stand on equity, gender equity, and how we can bring that to a concert series that's being programmed that I'm participating on, a panel that I'm serving on, or any other project that I'll be involved in. I feel uh, very empowered by the, the training that I've received and have taken part in over the last few years to be able to make those changes, suggest those changes, to, to speak in the interest of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and anti-racism, and, you know, just to be able to take these partners along on a, a journey with me too. Um, and as a, an educator, I work on um, really curating and creating um, a diverse curriculum that doesn't just reflect uh, 
white Western European classical music and to continue to broaden the curriculum in that way. Wonderful, thank you all. In closing, um, we hope that today's conversation at this virtual table uh, will contribute to bring more clarity on what are the issues at stake in the field today, in the classical music and new music field, and what are valuable um, solutions or approaches that can be used and are being used. Um, we also want to finally stress the importance, the relevance to have these conversations, somehow uncomfortable as well, um, as a way to acknowledge the problems that are present and the suffering that these problems have created, but also as a way to engage in bringing real change. Um, I want to thank all the panelists who have been here today with us. Um, and I want to remind uh, the audience that uh, Women Now has been launched and uh, we are going to have our second concert on Saturday, March 12th with um, violinist Ariel Holowitz and pianist Alexa Spear. And then there is a full calendar of events that can be uh, found at, on our website, extensiveconcertseries.com. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>